네, 안녕하세요 시청자 여러분 블록미디어 정윤재입니다 오늘은 정말 특별한 게스트를 모셨는데요 마일스트롬 펀드의 아서 헤이즈와 함께 암호화폐 시장에 대한 그의 뷰를 알아보는 시간을 가지도록 하겠습니다 Okay, hello Arthur First of all, thank you for taking the time to speak with us today It's a pleasure to have the opportunity to delve into your perspectives and insights Very nice to meet Thanks you for me. Okay, first of all Thank you for taking the time to speak with us today. And could you start by introducing yourself and the Maelstrom Fund? So my name is Arthur Hayes. I previously was the CEO of BitMEX, the derivatives platform that I founded back in 2014. We're most known for the invention and creation of the perpetual swap, which is the most traded product in crypto history. Subsequent to me stepping down at BitMEX, I founded the Maelstrom Fund, which is my family office where myself and a few investment professionals trade crypto. Most of what we do is invest in early stage token projects and we advise projects as well. Oh, okay, then thank you for your introduction and let's go into straight into the interview. So now the US presidential election currently is underway. So which candidate's victory do you believe would be more favorable to the cryptocurrency market? So right now the market believes that Trump is more favorable for crypto. I can see my Bitcoin chart right here as the states start coming in and yeah. the market seems to believe that Trump is winning the election and Bitcoin is going up. But at a broader sense, it doesn't matter whether it's Trump or Harris who wins the US presidential election because the US debt must expand to fund uh, the defense industry and to fund healthcare payments for the majority of older Americans. And so whether it's Trump or Harris, they're going to be in a straitjacket where they must print money. It's going to be in the trillions of dollars, and that's going to positively impact crypto regardless of who wins. So I know that people are very focused right now on you know, Trump or Harris, whether that's positive or negative for crypto, but that's a very short-term thing. Medium term, you know, post-January of next year, the U.S. government will be continuing to print trillions of dollars per year, and that's going to elevate the price of crypto. So you're saying that no matter who becomes elected, it, the U.S. government will print money. So printing money, you're seeing printing money can elevate the price of Bitcoin and altcoin markets. So how do you think of the Bitcoin dominance of these days? And how do you like foresee the Bitcoin dominance? So right now, this rally from 2022 till the present has been led by Bitcoin and very few altcoins outside of Solana have really participated in this bull market. I think that's large part due to the types of projects that have been listing this cycle. Unfortunately, a lot of project founders have gotten trapped in this VC game where they take a lot of money in private rounds. And then when they go to list on a centralized or decentralized exchange, they're pressured to list at a very high fully diluted valuation, FDV, with a low circulating supply. And when you know retail investors come to buy these new issues, they're extremely expensive. And so it's hard for the retail trader to make money. And as we've seen, most of the new issues on a median basis that launched in 2024 were down 40 to 50% from their listing price relative to the price of Bitcoin and Ethereum. So they've underperformed the general market by 50%. And so it's not I'm not surprised that a lot of these projects tokens are down, you know, 50, 60, 70, 80% from their listing price. And there's not a lot of enthusiasm from the retail investor. And that's led to this belief that there's not really a bull market in crypto because the altcoin ecosystem has not really rallied. I don't see that changing in the, you know, the very immediate term. I think Bitcoin does very, very well and it drags along a few majors like Ethereum and Solana or other like top 20 top 30 altcoins with it, but sort of the long tail of early stage tokens, I think founders still need to get a little bit more religion in terms of lowering the price of your token and not giving away so many tokens to exchanges. So you said because of the VC games and not many retail investors making money, the Bitcoin dominance is going up. You said you need the founders to lower the token price. Are there any more advices for the founders to make the altcoin market great again? I think focus on your users. I think a lot of time, a lot of founders, when we, we speak to them, are very focused on getting a centralized exchange listing 
because they believe that that's going to lead to a pump in the price. But the data is not showing that. It's showing that the majority of projects, the token price is going down after listing because their metrics aren't strong. They're focusing on bullshit metrics for venture capital firms versus trying to create real user engagement, using their token as a way to engender support from the community. And I think that's what needs to change. And I think we're slowly starting to see a mind shift of the founders in terms of how they want to structure their projects, how they want to engage in tokenomics to engage the community to participate alongside them in growing wealth. And along this question, these days, the the market cap of the centralized exchanges are going down and decentralized exchanges are going up. Do you think there is a relationship between these Bitcoin dominance and the VC games of the altcoins are doing some influence for these decentralized exchange market cap is going up? Real reason why DEXs are doing so well is that they're catering to the retail market, whether that's meme coin trading, so pumped up fun, Radium on Solana, whether that's sort of new ordinal trading on, on different new platforms on, uh, on Bitcoin, or they're reaching out to underserved markets that centralized exchanges are ignoring, or they're putting in place trading policies that are favorable to retail at the expense of high frequency trading firms who dominate the centralized exchange order flow. And so because DEXs are retail first, obviously they're going to grow as the retail trader or recognizes that trading on a sex might not be for them. It might not have the best products. It might not have the most exciting new things in crypto because a centralized exchange is focused on paying their lawyers and compliance folks as opposed to creating new products that the retail wants to trade. Thank you for the view for the year, view for the altcoin market. And so what is your current position on Bitcoin and Ethereum? And how do you foresee their performance by end of this year and throughout next year? So I think Bitcoin will lead the bull market you know, I think it's going to continue, as again, regardless of who wins the U.S. presidential election. By end of year, price target for Bitcoin is $100,000. Ethereum really needs to have a narrative shift between this Ethereum versus Solana. Obviously, Solana has done very, very well from FTX lows of $7 to I think $170 or whatever it is. Yeah, $170 right now. And I think that's large part due to increased revenue on chain because of increased transaction flows. But as Solana gets bigger, it's harder to generate those past stellar returns and past stellar growth and revenue. And I think Solana holders will get a bit disillusioned why Solana is going you know, quickly from 200 to say 500 to 1,000 and each starts to get some more momentum in terms of the price. And so I could definitely see by the end of this year for ETH sort of in the three to $4,000 range. Okay, so I think you're very bullish on Solana. So is there any reason now you're bullish on Solana? On the tradability of Solana, I don't really believe in the long term future of Solana in terms of it versus Ether, obviously, versus another company that we're very proud of, project that we're very behind at Maelstrom um, Aptos. However, that being said, the Solana community is very active, they're very engaged, they've done very well with the meme coins, good UI, UX with the, the browser based wallets. And so, because of that, it's I call it high beta Bitcoin. So if I want to take more risk and tethered to the big, you know, the appreciation of Bitcoin, I trade Solana because it's very liquid. I can get in and out of my position and it's a very trending market. So that's why I like Solana. But long term, it's not really an investment for me. It's a trading product. You said in the long term, um, you are looking for another layer one project. So there are so many layer one blockchains on this space. So what factors do you think will determine which projects will thrive? And are there any specific layer one projects you are particularly watching, such as Aptos? So obviously, I have a large position in Aptos. So that's my my bias, just to put that out there. I believe that Aptos, number one, has a very, very strong team. You know, ex-Facebook DM, they designed a very, you know, very good blockchain, move VM and all that kind of stuff. And the real proof is the partnerships that these chains can launch. Now, I can't talk about all the things that Aptos is going to be um, announcing within the next sort of one to two months. But needless to say, Aptos is going to be the place where large TradFi institutions who want to have a web-free offering or offer their products in the web-free space are going to choose Aptos. And that's what's going to drive increased transaction volume. The tech, you know, whether it's Move or any other particular parallelization method, doesn't really matter. All that matters is can these projects and these teams deliver high quality partnerships and do these partnerships lead to more on-chain transaction volume? That's what people should be looking at. 
disregard all the technical mumbo jumbo. It doesn't really matter. If you don't have any users, it doesn't matter how you know fast your testnet is or how fast you claim that you can process transactions, but you have no clients. So why do you think traditional financial institutions are choosing Aptos to partnership with while there are other layer ones? There's one thing, cost, the ability to do certain um, KYC functions natively uh, on the Aptos chain. And I, I think that they like the team and they, they find, find that they're very easy to work with. So I think those are some of the major factors that are leading to some of these institutions uh, using Aptos. Okay, so these days, um, what are your thoughts on the impact of AI machine learning on the cryptocurrency space? With the recent trend of AI agent-based meme coins, are you exploring any projects at the intersection of AI and blockchain? I've been writing about AI and blockchain, I think for over a year now, and I have a central thesis in that an AI agent will use a crypto or create their own crypto to interact with other AI agents because they understand computer code. They don't understand legacy finance because if you look at every single fiat currency in the history of human civilization, they all fail because humans are fallible and we get control of the currency supply, we inflate it, and then the currency system implodes under its own weight. But you know, blockchain is governed by math and computer code, not by the whims of, of humans. So that's why I believe that AI agents will choose crypto. I think they'll choose uh, Bitcoin, but they could create their own. And we've started this trend with the meme coins, which are completely worthless, attention-grabbing things but it goes to show what can happen when AI agents are properly incentivized to trade with each other, to communicate with humans over social media, and what type of tokens they can create in a trustless fashion that now proliferate in this ecosystem. That's why I own GOAT. You know, it's a worthless meme coin, but at the end of the day, it was the first one in a series of coins that AI agents will launch in the meme coin space. And it's going to be interesting to see what they launch, you know, in other spheres of crypto as well. In terms of Maelstrom, we have investments in Aether, which is more on the hardware side, giving enterprises and individuals the ability to buy, to rent and lease high quality AI chips like the NVIDIA, I think it's H100 or H1000 chips. We have investments in Alki Labs, which is at the forefront of DPIN, which is allowing spatial recognition and the use of, use of a decentralized network to hold that data and give the ability to see into these physical landscapes that we need to have for augmented reality and sort of AI agents to interact with us and sort of like retail stores, for example. So those are two highlighted investments that we've done uh, at Maelstrom. Um, uh, that was a very good opinion on AI and blockchain. Thing. So in the Korean market, a lot of investors are investing in Sui and Ripple. So these are very popular cryptocurrencies in Korea. So how is your views about these two cryptocurrencies? So I think Ripple is complete garbage. They've been trying to launch this sort of replacement of Swift for, I don't know, since I've been in crypto almost. Um, it's essentially a very well-crafted Ponzi scheme to sell Ripple to Muppets around the world. I'm not, this is, I've been on record saying this, but again, they have a very strong community. It's very liquid. And so I can understand why people like to trade the currency. I think that other stable coins and other networks have a much better chance of um, supplanting sort of SWIFT and, and the payment networks. You only have to look at Tether, USDC, Athena as things that actually are performing the function that Ripple claims that they're supposed to do, but is literally just, you know, I call it a meme coin trading. It's worthless, in my opinion. In terms of SWE, obviously, SWE and Aptos have some a similar sort of move-based architecture. I'm not going to get into the technical details of the differences. They're not that large between the two. It really comes down to who, which team and ecosystem do you think will deliver more high-quality partnerships that will drive transaction volume over time? I'm betting that Aptos can do that over time over SWE. So you're betting over Apto Aptos over SWE because of the Aptos team? And um, so in your opinion, what are the main factors that will drive the next bull market? Or are we now in the middle of the bull market, maybe? The bull market started in 2022 after FTX imploded. It really got going in the regional banking crisis in the U.S. in 2023 when the Fed and the U.S. Treasury stepped in and essentially stealth printed $4 trillion and guaranteed all of the deposits in the banking system. We were from Bitcoin about 20,000 to 74,000 in April of this year. 
I understand why a lot of investors think that the bull market hasn't happened because a lot of the altcoins that they held from 2021 are still underwater. A lot of the new issues that they bought in 2024 are down 50 to 95%. So I can understand why they think the bull market isn't here. But Bitcoin is in a bull market. We're in a bull market in terms of the amount of fiat liquidity that's going to be created around the world. The United States is printing money. China has just started its reflationary program to print money. Europe will follow to print money to try to rectify their economic problems. And Japan still prints money, even though the BOJ claims that they want to normalize rates. So the, the largest four economic blocks in the world are all emitting more fiat currency than they ever have in, human, in, in the existence of those economic blocks. And so, therefore, we are in a bull market of crypto, and it will only intensify going forwards. Okay, uh, thank you for the reason of the bull market. And so, could you share any personal guiding principles or philosophies you follow when evaluating new investments? Cash flow. Always look at cash flow. How am I going to get paid? So, if this project is successful, how does their success translate into me getting paid? And so, I think a lot of crypto projects don't really have a link between success of the project or the network and me getting paid. A very e easy example, Ethereum. If more people use Ethereum, more Ether gets burnt. If I'm a validator, I get paid in ETH. Therefore, the network has value and the token goes up. Something I've been very critical of, a, a network like Uniswap. Uniswap is probably the most successful DeFi application ever. They generate billions of dollars of fees every year. None of those fees go to the token holders. And so you've seen the um, Uni crypto, uh, the token, go from a high of, I think, something like $30 or $40 back in 2021, and now it's at sub-10. Uh, and it really, and Uniswap is still a monsterly successful application doing, you know, billions of dollars a day of flow, but there's no link between money into the protocol and, and the project, and revenue, sorry, and me as a token holder. And so I think when people are looking at tokens, read the documents, understand if they're successful, how do I get paid? And if you don't understand how that's going to happen, then avoid that project. Uh, so you've mentioned about Uniswap, and recently they they said they are going to make Unichain, and they are going to make some use cases of Uniswap coins. How do you think of this uh, change of Uniswap? So I, what I think is that they're going to try to do the similar structure to DYD. So DYDX was in the similar position as Uniswap. They made billions of dollars of revenue. They paid nothing out to token holders. And so what they did is they created their own chain on Cosmos, the DYDX chain, where um, validators who stake DYD receive all the trading fees from all volume done on the DYD Cosmos chain. So I bet Uniswap is going to do something similar to that, where if you own Unis uh, Uni, you bridge it over into the new chain, you stake that you're a validator of all the on-chain transactions, and therefore now you can get a cut of the revenue. I hope that's what they're going to do. I'd be very interested in owning the, uh, the Uni token if that's in their roadmap. Uh, okay, so it's another question from the cash flow of the token projects. So could you give an example of one more project there that has a very good cash flow related to tokenomics? What's going on right now? Well, I mean, I'd say the staked Athena. That's probably, I, I, mean, I own a lot of it. Athena, if you're not familiar, it's a stable coin. It's a synthetic dollar. They take Bitcoin and Ethereum and they sell a perpetual swap and a futures contract against it to earn the, the basis. And so this is income into the ecosystem, uh, the Athena ecosystem. And what happens is if you take the USDE, the, the dollar pegged stable coin, and you stake it with Athena, you lock it up um, for a minimum of seven days. That's how long it takes to get your money back. Then you get, I think, 80% of that interest income. And so right now, I think it yields something around 10 or 15%. APY. And that's a way that the revenue that they're generating from putting on this basis trade goes directly to those who stake the stable coin with the protocol. So I have a question about Athena. Athena is making a stable coin called USDE. And how do you think the USD is, what do you think about USDE's position in the stable coin market? Because it is using a de delta hedged way to make a stable coin uh, over than other collateralized stable coins such as USD. So I think it depends on what type of risk that you're willing to take. With USDT and USDC, you are betting that the US banking system will allow Tether to continue to put US dollars in US treasuries and custody those in the banking system. Without a bank account, Tether cannot exist, similar with USD. That's the risk that you're taking, regulatory US banking risk. The risk that you're taking with Athena 
is that there's counterparty risk with the centralized exchanges on which they hold crypto collateral and which they have shorted these perpetual swaps and futures contracts. So if something happens on those centralized exchanges, they get hacked or there's large socialized losses that don't allow PL to be paid out to the, the short holder, then Athena will suffer. And so it depends on which risk that you're willing to take, US dollar banking risk or centralized exchange crypto counterparty risk. Okay, so I'll go back to the question about the DEXs. Okay. So are there any DEXs that you are looking at these days or favorable DEXs that you are looking at? We are an advisor and investor in the Drift protocol on Solana. They have been doing amazing things recently. I think their average daily trading volume is up close to $300 million a day. Um, and so they have a very performant order book on Solana. They've launched a prediction market called BET. And the team is very engaged at providing a very usable and fast trading experience for perpetual swaps. And so that's the one that we're backing at Maelstrom. Um, these days, some of the Korean investors are looking at hyper liquid. So how do you think, how, do you have any opinions about the, this hyper liquid? I do not. From what I know, hyper liquid is essentially a centralized matching engine that tries to be decentralized on, not saying that's good or bad, depends on your, um, your view. I can't say much more than that because I'm not super involved. I know that they're doing well in terms of amount of trading volume and they may or may not have launched a token recently, but that's about all I know. Okay, this will be the last question. And so you recently launched a blog on Naver. Why did you prompt to start it? And what do you hope to achieve through this blog through the Korean investors? So the Korean trading market is probably the largest trading market of crypto globally. Definitely on a per capita basis, but also probably an absolute notional, you know, close league of, of China. But, you know, there's only, what, 20, 30 million people in Seoul versus however many hundreds of millions of people on the coastal cities in China trading crypto. So it's a very engaged community. It's a very digitally connected community. And so I think that in terms of our first foray into non-English language and localization of the content that we're trying to put out there it makes a lot of sense. I live in Asia. I'm in the same time zone. I love Korea. So I think it's a great market. That's why we launched our neighbor blog. We want to have high quality translations of the information that we're putting out there. And, you know, over time, hopefully we do more, you know, events and interviews like this to sort of educate the Korean market on what we're doing at Maelstrom for people whose ling first language isn't English. We really hope to in do another interview with you, maybe at the end of the year or next year. Absolutely. And we are very uh, looking forward to your neighbor blog articles too. Thank you for no, coming for the interview. Thank you. Yeah, and that was a very great interview. Blog Media 독자 여러분, 오늘은 아서 헤이즈와의 인터뷰를 진행해 보았는데요. 오늘 유익한 내용이 되셨는지 댓글로 피드백 부탁드리고요. 앞으로도 계속 팔로우 해주시면 감사하겠습니다. 구독 좋아요 눌러주세요. 감사합니다.